So, now to this talk. This is Luke Gottschling. He's standing there and he will talk about, uh, yes, you know, Turing tests. That's probably something everybody should know in here. But maybe um, in the meanwhile, some tools are good enough to simulate something. Well, what, uh, what, for example, a three-year one cannot beat. So there may be some more interesting questions. What is intelligence? And yes, the same tool may not be able to translate a book or something. And yes, so we want to get a general thing about this. And this is the talk, the quest for artificial general intelligence. Thank you. I think we should all get some sort of award for surviving the weather of the past few days. And thank you for showing up at, for the first talk of today. So my name is Luke. I spend most of my time getting computers to try to understand documents. And this is the quest for artificial general intelligence beyond the Turing test. So a good starting point, of course, is how do we define artificial intelligence? Um, there is no one single definition. One way we can define it is by saying intelligent behavior in artifacts. This works pretty well. What about a longer definition? Well, Rich and Knight say the study of how to make computers do things at which, at the moment, people are better. Um, but there's a little bit of controversy about this because not everyone agrees that we should be comparing them to, to people. And so Benjamin Bratton says, that we would wish to define the very existence of AI in relation to its ability to mimic how humans think that humans think will be looked back upon as a weird sort of speciesism. What about artificial general intelligence, or AGI? Well, one definition for this by Gertzel and Panachin is systems that possess a reasonable degree of self-understanding, autonomous self-control, and have the ability to solve a variety of complex problems in a variety of contexts and to learn to solve new problems that they didn't know about at the time of their creation. And this whole learning process, I think, is really fundamental for AI and AGI. So let's try to break this down. If something is going to be generally intelligent, what must it have? Well, it has to have the ability to solve problems, general problems, in a non-domain restricted way in the same sense that a human can. And I Kind of the flip side of this, it also has the have to have the ability to solve problems in particular domains and particular contexts with particular efficiency. So, for example, it has to be able to be really good at chess and maybe really good at summarizing a book. And then combining the previous two, so it has to be both generalized and have specialized intelligence capabilities and use these things in a unified way. Going back to the previous definition, the ability to learn from the environment, from other intelligence systems and teachers. It's this learning thing I think that's really key. It's that it gets better over time. And really the only way to do that from an intelligence basis is to learn. And of course, to become better at solving novel types of problems as it gains experience with them. So, the year is 1950, Alan Turing is at the University of Manchester, and he has a question. His question is, can machines think? So, I mean, it's a very philosophical question, obviously, but before he goes on to define what eventually becomes known as the Turing test, he actually has an interesting analogy, and that is a new form of the problem, which is known as the imitation game. And this is a very simple game played without any computers or any machines, it's three people, a man, A, a woman, B, and an interrogator, C, who may be of either sex. And the interrogator is isolated from the other two. Now, the interrogator is going to ask questions of A and B and going to try to determine which of them is the man and which is the woman. Um, and obviously the key to make this game interesting is that the man and the woman have to agree in advance about who, who they're both going to try to be. So one of them is going to be lying. Um, so he can't just say like, hey, are you a man? Um, because they, they both should answer the same way, in which case this, that's what makes this game interesting. And of course the objective is for the interrogator to determine which of the two people is the man and which is the woman. And then, so starting with this original test, he defines what becomes known as 
the Turing tasks. And so he says, we now ask the question, what will happen when a machine takes the part of A in this game? Will the interrogator decide wrongly as often when the game is played like this as he does when the game is played between a man and a woman? These questions replace our original, can machines think? And so it should, it should be noted that this is not a, like, a formal uh, problem definition from a mathematical point of view. This is more of a guideline, but it's still a very, very widely accepted guideline for, for machine intelligence or, or general intelligence. Now, the field of AI has suffered a lot of hype and setbacks over many decades. Um, one of the original failed predictions for AI is this one. I believe that in about the year 2000, it will be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of 125 megabytes to make them play so well that an average interrogator will not have more than a 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. Who said this and what, what year did they say this? Well, it was actually Alan Turing in 1950, and this is one of the first failed predictions about artificial intelligence. So another kind of uh, challenge for general intelligence is people will say something like, well, okay, so the computer can solve certain types of problems, but well, you know, it can't drive a car. Um, and then the 80s happened, um, and then at Carnegie Mellon and Bundeswehr University Munich, um, we had the first uh, autonomous vehicles that were able to navigate a course. Um, you'll notice that both of these vehicles are trucks, and of course the reason for that is because all of the computing hardware had to, be, had to fit in the car, and it, the computing hardware in those days was so large that the smallest vehicle they could get was a truck that would fit everything. And of course, we've, uh, we've come a little bit since then. We now have cars that are able to navigate public roads alongside human drivers and do so more safely than the human drivers. And then cars that are even able to go 130 mile uh, journeys completely autonomously in the desert. Now, we can't buy these cars yet, but I think it's only a matter of time before we'll be, these cars are gonna be on the roads more so than they are now, and we're gonna be able to buy one because they are going to be safer than human drivers. Now, they used to say that, well, okay, so AI can do certain things, but it can't beat a chess world champion. Well, we know what happened in 1996, and that is Garry Kasparov lost to IBM's Deep Blue, um, being the first time that a computer defeated a, a chess world champion. Um, the hardware in Deep Blue is kind of interesting because it was 30, 120 megahertz chips and 480 custom VLSI chips. You can't really, you know, and this was one of the top 500 supercomputers at the time, but if you look at the Limpac benchmark, it's really funny because the capacity or the computational power was about 11 iPhones worth. Now, what about Jeopardy? I think if we remember back a few years ago that this Jeopardy um, was defeated by a machine. Um, IBM's Watson defeated the top Jeopardy players back in 2011, so that's, that problem has been solved as well. Now, what about recognizing things inside of photographs? Um, so there has been some progress with this. Uh, Zoo and others have, for example, shown that you can take a scene and a computer can say it's a woman throwing a frisbee in a park or a dog standing on a hardwood floor um, but it's not really quite there yet because in this case, the top, it identifies it as a man wearing a hat and a hat on a skateboard. So I don't know how it got that from that picture. And then the bottom one is a man is talking on his cell phone while another man watches. Well, he's eating a sandwich. So I think we still have some work to do. So let's take this image of a panda and the computer says, well, it's a panda with 57.7% confidence. Now, uh, Goodfellow and others have shown that you can actually add some noise to this image. Uh, in this case, the noise is identified as a nematode with 8.2% confidence. It didn't really do a good job there. But the purpose of this noise is to actually to trick the computer. So the end result still looks like a panda to us. But to the computer, 
um, it has been deliberately tricked. It no longer looks like a panda to the computer. In fact, it looks like a gibbon to the computer with 99.3% confidence, and so it's been, uh, it's been fooled. So yeah, we still have some work to do there. Now, a lot of development for intelligence has been influenced by uh, animal brains. Um, neural networks, obviously, were originally influenced by biology. And so actually just very, very recently, we've been able to look at what does the actual human brain look like, or in this case, what does a mouse brain look like, which is uh, at, at a very low level is actually gonna be similar to a human brain. Um, and so here we have one axon in blue, which is used for transmitting signals, connecting to a dendrite, which is in green, which receives signals through five separate synapses, which are in orange. And so you multiply this by 100 billion and you have the human brain. So let's zoom out a little bit. Um, it's remarkable how we can do all of these tasks when at the end of the day, it, if you look at our brain at a low level, it just looks like a really big jumble of, uh, of molecules. So let's, let's, do a, let's do a comparison between a computer and a human brain. So computation. Computer, about a billion transistors. Human brain, about 100 billion neurons. Storage, okay, we have some RAM and some hard drive space in the computer. The human brain, again, has neurons. So I think one of the more remarkable things about, I guess, the way that we or, or animals function is that neurons are used for both computation and storage. Um, and we, obviously we, we, we have a separation of this stuff for computers, but we don't have this for for biology. What about the cycle time? Well, 10 to the negative nine seconds for computers, and unfortunately we're not that quick, 10 to the negative three seconds for the human brain. Operations per second, about 10 to the 10th for the computer. However, 10 to the 17th for the human brain, which I think is remarkable that we perform seven orders of magnitude, more computations per second, more operations per second than a computer. Uh, obviously, we're not really good at doing floating point operations at that rate, um, but it's still kind of fascinating. And then memory updates per second, similar, about four orders, four orders of magnitude in the human brain than in a computer. So um, let's, let's take that concept, and what if, maybe we can bridge the gap a little bit. Can we form a network with multiple animal brains that cooperate and exchange information using brain-to-brain -brain interfaces? So Pas Vieira, actually, th this year, have shown that, yes, it is, this is, in fact, possible. So this is, you know, I think, a really good stepping stone. And they actually did, it, did this with rats. And so they had electrical um, nodes that were connected to these rats' brains that they would stimulate, and these, these rats were separated, and then they would basically, if they synchronized their brain activity, they would get rewarded with water. Um, and this was really fascinating because it turns out that four connected uh, rat brains are better at solving problems than a single rat brain, so you actually do get an amplification of intelligence in this way. And they even did use them for really interesting things, like for example, weather uh, forecasting. It turns out four rats are better at forecasting the weather than a single rat. Really, I don't, like, really fascinating kind of result. Um, so what about, what about science? What about science questions? Well, um, this is the sort of question that a 10-year-old may be expected to answer. What form of energy causes an ice cube to melt? And then you have four choices. And in this case, obviously, it's heat. Um, and so Hickson and others have shown that you can actually build a knowledge graph and it'll have enough information that it's actually going to be able to answer this question. Uh, here's another question. In which environment would a white rabbit be best protected from predators? Now, the word white doesn't appear in any of the questions, so the system has to be able to infer that, one, the color of the rabbit's fur is actually relevant, and the color of snow is similar enough to the color of the fur, and then that is important in terms of camouflage and protection from predators. So the naive or completely unintelligent result for this is to basically get 25% of the questions right because you get four choices. It turns out that the 
uh, the software is able to get 57% of these questions correct. So it's actually doing reasonably well. Now let's take a hypothetical person. This credit for this goes to Josh Tenenbaum. Um, we take a hypothetical person called Boris. So, you know, going back to our previous example where we have the knowledge graph, maybe we just build a huge knowledge graph and then we have solved intelligence. Is the mother of Boris's father his grandmother? Yes. Is the daughter of Boris's sister his grandmother? No. Is the mother of Boris's sister his mother? Well, if she's a biological sister, then the answer is yes. Now, what about this question? Is the son of Boris's sister his son? Now, you want to say no, but Boris and his family were stranded on a desert island when he was a young boy. So that obviously changes the probability of this answer. But what if they were stranded alone or with one other family, two other, five other, 50 other families? What if they were rescued when he was 12 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 45 years old? And so you can't just rely on a knowledge graph because all this other context is important in terms of influencing the probability of something like this. Let's look at another one. Is the son of Boris's wife his son? Well, Boris is an international businessman who often takes long trips away from home. But he gets very jealous, so he locks his wife in the basement during his trips. <laughs> Unbeknownst to him, his wife used to be a professional escape artist. <laughs> so in this whole thing around context, um, It's not what? I'm just, I'm quoting, uh, I'm quoting Josh Tenenbaum on, I understand your concern. Uh, I'm just quoting Josh Tenenbaum on, on that stuff. I'm not saying that like the, those things are what they are. I just, just he, those were the, those are a standard set of questions that he came up with or a yeah. standard set of probability influencing things that he came up with. Yeah, but everybody laughs at at least too many people. So thanks, that's not funny. Okay, so in, the, in this whole sphere of context, um, we have some questions that are very easy for us to answer that are hard for computers to answer. So the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. What was too big? Well, we know right away that the answer is the trophy, but it's actually very, very difficult for computers to know this uh, answer. Similarly, the town councillors refused to give the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence. Who feared violence? Well, it's clear to us that it is the town councillors who fear violence, but because we understand demonstrations and permits and town councillors and who may want, who may incite violence, um, and it's actually very, very difficult to, to program all of this additional kind of human understanding and context into the software so that it's able to effectively answer these questions. So Vinyals and Lee have uh, developed an interesting program where they take, they take help desk conversations and they try to basically build a software that is able to answer questions um, within a help desk kind of context. And so for example, you may not be talking to, you may not know you're talking to a machine, but in this example, uh, you are. So, hi, this is Name from Help Desk Connect. What can I help you with today? And then the human says, hi, I forgot my password. Okay, great. So, it's really funny that uh, the machine in this case has actually done a pretty interesting job of replicating a uh, Help Desk conversation. What about adaptability? Siri, play some cool music, please. You don't have any cool music. Um, obviously, it doesn't, doesn't realize the context. Ambiguity. Is, is Mickey larger than Pluto? Perhaps. I mean, we know what we're talking about here. Is Mars larger than Pluto? Well, different, different things here. So now, how big is Pluto? There is a chatbot uh, called Mitsuko that's one of the, one of the current um, state-of-the-art chatbots. So for example, you can ask something like, what is bigger, an elephant or a person? I would say an elephant is a little bigger than a person. Well, I mean, I guess most of us would not say little, but 
That is correct. How many presidents of the US were called Bush? No idea, I am not really into politics. Should Greece leave the Euro? I think they need to seriously consider it, it just isn't working. Should Fu leave the bar? Maybe you should ask someone older. <laughs> now, what about the proliferation of some of these systems and the impact on privacy? For example, Facebook's new photo app won't launch in Europe because of facial recognition. So there's a question here of, of regulation and AI. Um, it, this is a feature, I mean, the fact that uh, you may say like, okay, well, it doesn't really matter what is behind it, it's, it's the privacy aspect of it, but I think the proliferation of AI is, um, is related to this, um, where we actually are seeing AI being regulated, obviously from the feature, from what it does, um, but I think it's interesting, I think we're gonna see more of this in the future. There's been a lot of talk lately about evil AI. Uh, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking have, have spoken about this. Uh, Benjamin Bratton says something interesting. What we fear more than a big machine that wants to kill us is one that sees us as irrelevant. Worse than being seen as an enemy is not being seen at all. The ultra-intelligent machine is a machine that believes that people cannot think. Jack Good. So is this our future? I don't know. How do we find out how good we're getting or how close to that potential evil future we are? Well, we can apply some other tests. For example, the reverse Turing test, where instead of a person trying to determine if someone is a computer, one of the people tries to convince the person that they're actually not human and are, they're a computer. And obviously, it turns out the better you are at understanding computer science, the, the better you are at, this tur as, at that test. Subject matter expert Turing test, can a computer replicate an expert in a particular subject matter. The coffee test I think is interesting. Can a machine go into an average home, find the coffee machine, find the coffee, and go through the entire set of steps so that there's a cup of coffee at the end? Uh, I think it's, it's, it, that's, that's a pretty interesting one. The Ebert test is can a machine tell a joke that causes people to laugh? And on the subject of computer-generated jokes, uh, Jess Johnson built a Lisp program that generates jokes based off of homonyms. So for example, what do you get when you cross a port with frosted flakes? I don't know, but it's cereal. What do you get when you cross an alien with a chicken? An extraterrestrial. <laughs> Other tests. The Robot University student by Gertzel. Can a robot go to college, go to university, enroll in classes, pass those classes, and get a degree. Obviously, we're very far away from that. Employment test, can a robot or machine have a job and perform that job as well as the human in that job? And obviously, for certain highly automated tasks, this has already been done. And the total Turing test, where it re relies on manipulating physical objects and being able to see the world. So here's some more thoughts for the future about what it can't currently do, or maybe it already does. Can it beat humans in the stock market? Maybe, if someone, was able, if someone is already doing this, would they tell you? Probably not. Uh, can it make this presentation? Can it make any presentation? Can it advocate against regulating AI, thereby ensuring its future survival? Maybe make an argument for more funding for AI? Interesting. What about devising a secure cryptographic scheme? What about defining human rights? What about promoting human rights? What about improving the quality of human life? Now, I think it's interesting that, you know, we, we kind of think about like building these perfect machines. Uh, George Dyson has a great thing where he says, instead of trying to build infallible machines, we should be developing fallible machines that are able to learn from their mistakes. So I'd like to leave off with some fun with image recognition. This is the Wolfram Alpha image recognition system. And so what, what's in this picture? An at, -AT? Nope, it's a ski pole. <laughs> what about this one? It's a cement mixer. <laughs> How about this one? A flying boat. <laughs> what about this one? A hunting dog. 
How about this one? A stealth bomber. <laughs> and how about this one? A person. <laughs> and that is all. Thank you. Hello? Yes. So this was uh, Luke Gottschling. And if you have some questions, you can ask them at the microphone there and there. Um, I have to excuse myself because I forgot to announce that this talk was translated to German as every other talk now is translated. And you could have heard it, but probably everybody who needs this already knows these numbers. And yes, sorry that I did not announce it. But you can clap for them because they did it anyway. <laughs> so I don't see anybody or for the questions. So well, yes. Then uh, there's someone coming up. Left microphone first, please, or the right for you. Uh, hey, thanks for your talk. A lot of the examples you gave were actually rather narrow AI, right? Like programs that solve specific problems. But you were going to talk about AGI, so what efforts do you see in that direction? So I think uh, IBM's Watson is kind of the, one of the most uh, remarkable ones, and then the kind of the, like the chatbot, like Mitsuko, for example, you know, asking anywhere from political questions to is an elephant larger than a person. Um, I think uh, th things that kind of do general knowledge are are kind of the what we're currently you know considering the the closest to artificial general intelligence. Uh, so I think it's really just things like that. I mean, obviously we're still very far from the coffee test where a, a machine is able to enter a home and make coffee. Um, a lot of the obviously a lot of research is focused on improving things and you know it turns out that it's easier to make improvements on very, very specific domains. But things like IBM's Watson answering general questions, including questions with wordplay, and things uh, like the chatbot where you can ask all manners of questions, I think are, are basically as, as close as we're getting, and there's some interesting research in those areas. Um, I have a small question concerning the um, red brain thingy. Mm -hmm. um, did you check if the significance of that is like valid? Is, I mean, uh, probably you don't know the, the significance of it, but um, was it really tested or is it just some kind of um, social science statistics? No, no, no. It was, it was statistically significant and uh, in, in all of my slides I have references. So if you download the slides, I actually have a link to that original paper. So you can actually read that whole paper yourself. It was actually, no, it was, it was uh, statistically significant. Okay, thanks. And the last question also from that microphone. I had, um, yeah, I tried some um, general game playing. I, I think you know what it is. And I wanted to know what you think about this field of uh, artifi artifi yeah. Int artificial intelligence. What, what, the, the game playing, you say? Yeah, general game playing. Right, right. Like, so, like, like the, the recent thing about like playing Mario? Uh, yes, but general game playing is uh, you have a artificial intelligence right. that uh, gets the rules of a game mm -hmm. and then plays the game. So it doesn't know what game it um, plays before the play starts. So um, I think that's a really interesting right. uh, field of artificial artificial intelligence yeah I, I mean you could do some of that stuff with uh, with uh, unsupervised learning um, in the case of there's a uh, some more famous example lately of playing Mario where basically they just try 
different things and then like basically replay the game like thousands or millions of times and then they learn up to a certain point and then they try something and then if, if you die then they restart and then they try something else. So it's interesting because it's effectively completely unsupervised if, like if if you die in the game, then you just rest then then the software restarts and it tries something different going forward. So it can actually mm -hmm. learn to play that game in a way that uh, th that you know, like then once it's fully trained on that game, when you see how it plays, it actually looks like a human player playing the game because it's doing all of the moves to get through a given level. Yeah. Thanks. So again, a nice applause for Luke Gottling. I think. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs>